Hi, and welcome to the ISUOG uh, Facebook Live. Um, thank you for joining us um, today. Um, this is just before our early bird deadline, which is going to be on Monday, the 16th of August. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to talk to you about what's new at the Congress. Um, I'm Gabrielle, I'm the events manager for ISUOG, and I'm joined by two members of the scientific committee. So the scientific committee are the volunteers of the organization who spend at least a whole year trying to put together the a program that really reflects the latest developments in the field and best practices. Um, so I'll first introduce George Condus. Hi, George, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And um, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, tell the audience a little bit about you. Hi, Gabrielle, uh, evening to... Um all those that have tuned into our live Facebook feed this evening or this morning or yesterday, depending what time of day it is. So I'm currently in Sydney, Australia, and uh, the current uh, chair for the uh, chair for the ISWOG Scientific Committee. I've been involved with ISWOG since 2001 when I was a fellow back in the UK and uh, been to every meeting for the last 20 years. So in my role as the scientific chair, which commenced just over a year ago, I've been intimately involved with the organization of the program, ensuring that it um, comes together and showcases the best talents around the world in all aspects of uh, women's imaging. So you really are the best, one of the best people to be in the SciComm chair position, be coming so from like 20 years when you sort of first um, heard and got involved with us and now to, to be in the chair of the uh, scientific committee. Yeah, I can remember the first time I ever gave, uh, my first ever oral presentation was in New York. I think it was in 2002. And I presented on PULs and I was so excited. And I'm sure Fabrizio, who you were introduced in a moment, tell us the story. And got up to present in New York. I was so excited. I think there were like four people in the audience. And I thought, is this it? <laughs> but persistence prevails. And yeah, no, it's amazing. So my time with ISWOG over the last 20 years has been incredibly fulfilling. And um, so many great friends, so many amazing experiences, so many amazing uh, cities that we visited. So. Um, for all those young up-and-coming uh, academics or up-and-coming next generation ISWOG members, I'd encourage you to, to jump in boots on all and really get as much out of society as possible. Oh, that's brilliant. I don't know what's worse, uh, four people or, you know, 400 people. So, uh, I'm also yeah. very pleased to be joined by uh, Fabrizio de Silva Costa. Um, Fabrizio, would you like to sort of introduce yourself um, explain a little bit about your position on the scientific committee and um, maybe your first presenting uh, experience. Yes, hi, hi Gabriel. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's nice to, to be here. And hello, everyone, in different parts of the world that you are. Uh, yeah, it's very exciting to be part of the scientific committee. I, I'm a member of the scientific committee in the last four years. I started uh, before the uh, Singapore conference and I was uh, part of, uh, of the people that put the program together since the Singaporean conference. A couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, I'm very proud about it. I was uh, el uh, elected vice chair of the scientific committee for uh, obstetrics. It means that my involvement is going to uh, increase and. I look forward to work with uh, George Condus uh, uh, that uh, is going to, to lead as he he's already is the uh, gynecological program. And uh, I'm sure that working together, we'll be able to attract the best speakers uh, in the planet from uh, uh, for our conferences. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, it's so exciting to have you both here today as the two, you know, um, current uh, chair of the scientific committee and incoming chair of the scientific committee. So it will be, uh, it'll be good to hear what you find interesting and, you know, maybe something later on about what we're going to develop in future years. So um, we're here to talk about the Virtual Congress Scientific Program ahead of the early bird. Um, we're going to start with some questions about the programs, um, but if any of the viewers at home have a question, please put it in the text box underneath and we'll try to come to it at the end. So I think we're just going to jump into it. Um, Fabrizio, maybe you can start. So what's new um, at the 2021 World Congress this year? I think that our program is uh, so uh, new and exciting. 
uh, we, we had to learn since last year because of the pandemic how to build uh, an interesting uh, uh, online Congress. And uh, I think that uh, we are very successful last year. Uh, we had uh, an amazing uh, number of delegates join our conference and uh, this was very uh, well ranked uh, by uh, the uh, assistants. And of course, uh, this year we're trying uh, to, uh, to do even better than last year. Now we have the uh, experience and uh, the online world uh, makes uh, our life uh, a little bit easy because basically we can invite people from completely different places and some people that normally is not traveling uh, uh, for uh, the ISOG congresses. We are uh, increasing uh, our uh, speakers uh, cohorts with uh, people that's doing very nice work and they are not so familiar uh, with ISOG. Uh, one thing that I, I, I like to call your attention is for uh, artificial intelligence. I think that's a very hot topic uh, in ultrasound, not just in obstetrics, but in gynecology. I'm sure that George is going to talk ab about it in some time. Uh, we have, you know, very nice names uh, that uh, they are working uh, with interesting projects in this area. Uh, one of them is uh, Helen Feltovich. Uh, Helen uh, is our colleague from the scientific committee that's going to uh, present some interesting uh, uh, topics uh, about internet, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Ellen is going to chair uh, one session that I, I really, really personally looking forward to watch. Uh, it's a, a session that Professor Mary Ellen uh, Geiger, uh, she's a radiologist uh, from uh, Chicago and she's not very familiar uh, with us, she works with breast cancer but she's going to present uh, data science in imaging, basically uh, bringing uh, big data, uh, the tools of internet, uh, artificial intelligence uh, to help in terms of ultrasound diagnosis. And there's no doubt that uh, you'll be a, a very, very nice uh, talk. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also that talk about um, AI in uh, low income countries. And I know that's one of the sessions where um, we really want people to come and talk about really what can AI do um, in different settings, because we know that, you know, there's, you know, the sky is going to be the limit, but actually what's coming up um, that it actually can support with. I think, George, um, you were talking a little bit about that in the Gynae program, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, as Fab said, we, one of, you know, one of the, probably one of the fastest growing fields in, in medicine currently is is the evolution and the and the traje fast trajectory of artificial intelligence and um, the, the potential clinical applications within the next five to ten years are, are mind-blowing and so we'll be touching on some of these topics and some of these themes during the world congress this year in october um, there's uh, in, and in fact one of the plenary lectures is going to be given by professor Michaela van der Schaar, who is the professor of machine learning and artificial intelligence from the Cambridge Center. So the work that she's doing is, is truly cutting edge. And if you were to potentially extrapolate the clinical applications of AI within the imaging world and in women's health itself, there's the, the, the possibilities for us to even consider shortening the, the eight year interval from presentation to diagnosis for young women with endometriosis. And by having algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms that could potentially view subtle aspects of endometriosis, which untrained radiologists, untrained sonologists may not be able to see. I think that, it, that, that the potential to shorten that, that diagnostic delay, I think has a huge benefit for not only quality, quality of life for young women, but also fertility rates. So the, 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 uh, the, it's a very exciting field. So a great part of the program coming up in October. Yeah, it really sounds like there's sort of everything covered from the, you know, the very top level blue skies thinking about where this can go to what other professions are doing and what's applicable to obstetrics and gynecology to all, like the actual day to day clinical practice and then where the future's going so that everyone, I guess, is, is really looking at this from lots of different angles and will be sort of relevant to whether you just want to know what's coming up in the next few years or what's coming up in the future and um, you will be able to take something from it. Absolutely. Great. And um, George, what's um, in the Gynae program um, 
would you like to sort of specifically highlight? Specifically highlight? Well, I think one of the uh, growing and and uh, and evolving and um, developing almost subspecialties within ultrasound is the um, the confluence or the, the the amalgamation between ultrasound skills and surgical skills, and so you're seeing within the gynecological, gynecological oncology field within the uh, the realms of endometriosis uh, surgery and endometriosis management, um, individuals who not only perform the ultrasound scan and potentially stage the cervical cancer or stage the ovarian cancer, but then go on to do the the, the clearance of the suboptimal bulking of the disease. And similarly, we're seeing the same in the endometriosis field where experts. Um, uh, imaging uh, sonology type individuals are also those that can manage such high complex surgical cases with multidisciplinary teams with, uh, calling on the skills of colorectal surgeons and urologists. So the, the emergence, I think, of, of uh, ultrasound uh, technicians who also have surgical skills and the surgeon sonologists will be featured with, uh, with the, uh, live sessions and uh, uh, within the actual program this year. And I think what it highlights is that um, we're challenging the traditional concept where um, ultrasound is a purely diagnostic tool performed by people who can only perform ultrasound and surgery is a technical skill that's learned by only those that perform surgeries. But in fact, these, 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 uh, these domains, rather than being mutually exclusive, actually have a lot in common. So that will be uh, explored and, and discussed in detail at this year's Congress. That's excellent. And I think that's always something really important to note about the um, ISRO program is, although, you know, it's ultrasound and imaging in the title, we are really looking at very like broad topics um, as well and, um, and how they sort of interplay with different multidisciplinary teams and um, the cross and connection with, uh, with different departments. Um, and also, Gabrielle, I mean, it's really an extension of what's also already been happening, and Fab will speak to this, within the, the, the fetal ultrasound and fetal surgery world, where individuals that are luminaries in ultrasound have also been the individuals that perform the fetal surgeries or the balloons for diaphragmatic hernias. So um, it, it has already been happening within the fetal medicine world, but I think that's starting now to be seen more, more, more prominently within the gynecological world. Sounds like it's going to be very um, interesting and, and not to miss session. Um, and Fabrizio, do you have what else is going on in the sort of OBS program that is sort of similar or um, you'd want to make? Yeah, I was, I, was, I was going to mention uh, what George uh, uh, just said. Uh, obstetrics, uh, traditionally, uh, we do more than just uh, ultrasound, uh, uh, just imaging. Uh, a number of us, we are performing a uh, fetal surgery. Uh, that's a, a big extension, uh, not just in diagnosis, but treatment and the follow-up after treatment. We have some uh, exciting uh, brand new uh, data coming from the total trial uh, that uh, Professor Yan de Prest just uh, published two major papers at the New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, he's going to present uh, the results of this major trial for the treatment of uh, diaphragmatic hernia intrauterus. And uh, on that session, uh, uh, there is a, a, a colleague from Belgium presenting a simulation of the technique. And I'm sure that this is going to attract a lot of uh, attention. And uh, the, the other uh, interesting topics that in obstetrics, uh, we do uh, screening is not just ultrasound, but we, we, we do screening for aneuploidy, uh, a very up and coming uh, area that's the screening for pregnancy complications, especially preeclampsia, that's coming from the research fields to clinical implementation right now. A series of uh, uh, centers and researchers, they are going to present uh, during the Congress uh, a clinical data about implementation of screening uh, for placental dysfunction that's related with preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, and uh, preterm birth. And it's very exciting to see uh, something that was presented at the first time uh, at this org back in 2009, uh, coming to real clinical practice, and now uh, with uh, numbers uh, uh, to support uh, its implementation. Amazing. And are people going to be able to take sort of takeaway messages from that research? Um... 
I'm sure uh, and this certainly is uh, an area that, that the implementation is happening right now. I'm sure that a lot of uh, attendees of the uh, Congress will be very keen uh, to set up uh, a screening for pregnancy complications uh, on their clinics and hospitals. And I'm sure that they are going to learn a lot of uh, with the experience of the leaders in the fields. Not, not just uh, from the research perspective, but now uh, with real clinical implementation. That's great. And is there any other, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, research that's being presented, um, but George, do you have any research that you'd like to sort of highlight as well that is sort of hot off the press, up and coming, um, that will be really of interest to our listeners? Well, I think that there's going to be a, a big contribution from the Belgian group, so Timmermans group will be talking about the latest advances and results in relation to the IOTA phase five. So that's very exciting and uh, always very clinically relevant. Um, so to Thierry van, Bosch, Dem, uh, Thierry van Bosch's team and also um, Elizabeth Epstein will be talking about their results for the different IETA studies. Um, and so all of these are very clinically relevant. Some something that's slightly digressing from, from the original research is that we've, um, we're gonna be visiting the debates again this year. And so we've put together some really hot topics for the, um, for the gynae debates. And, and one of the topics we'll be discussing a really common clinical situation that we all see in our practices from a, from a gynae perspective. And that's where a patient is referred to us who's completely asymptomatic, postmenopausal with no bleeding whatsoever. And an ultrasound scan is noted to have a thickened endometrium. And so the question is, should we intervene or not? So we've got two great experts talking on the for and against side. So I'm Bill Valentin and Thierry Vandenbosch. And a really another interesting and growing aspect of, uh, of pelvic pain within the adolescent population is whether or not we should be offering young girls or uh, young women who are not sexually active, um, either a transvaginal scan or a transrectal scan, because we know that in such populations, it's possible to have causes of pain, including endometriosis. And if we only perform a transabdominal scan, then we don't really get a lot of information from that basic scan. So there's a growing number of individuals that with consent, uh, with bowel prep, it's possible to perform either a TV scan or a transrectal scan in a person that hasn't been sexually active. And so we've got um, uh, Davor Yurkovich on the uh, against side and Matthew Leonardi from Canada on the for side for offering young individuals with pelvic pain potential for advanced imaging to help with their clinical situation. Oh, that's excellent. It sounds, they sound brilliant. I mean, we know that our debates are normally the really, really popular because you see, you know, sort of the leaders in the field really thrash out problems that people have to face every single day. And although maybe um, <laughs> there's never a clear cut answer, or there's sometimes it's quite, quite a lot of gray answers, um, it's really good to hear them kind of discuss that and go through all the different scenarios um, and the different practice and the different sort of schools of thought. And Fabrizio, I think there's a debate in the obstetrics program, right, that kind of touches on the sort of the guidelines and, you know, bit of a bit of a debate between which one to go for. Uh, this uh, there's a very exciting uh, a debate coming uh, because uh, recently we had the publication of the uh, ESOR guidelines about fetal growth restriction and uh, the American guidelines uh, of fetal growth restriction uh, coming from uh, ACOG and the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. And these uh, guidelines, they uh, actually, uh, they, they are different. Uh, the way to, uh, to make the diagnosis of fetal growth restriction and the follow up and time of delivery, they have some major differences. And you're going to have uh, uh, two leaders of these uh, guidelines debating the differences and uh, what's the best way to predict the outcomes in fetal growth restriction. Christoph Lis is going to present the ESOR guideline and Alfred Abu Hamad's the American guideline. And of course, uh, these guidelines, they are quite influential around the world and a, a lot of uh, different countries, they are adopting these guidelines and the big question, what's the best way to make the diagnosis? Or, or what's the best way to manage these uh, very high-risk pregnancies? And uh, I'm sure that you are going to learn about, about uh, with this, uh, this uh, discussion of these uh, top uh, experts in the, in the fields. 
That's excellent. And can you tell us which one's the best way? <laughs> uh, Australasia, <laughs> Australasia uh, is is quite a, a European uh, uh, based. Uh, I think that we work in a quite similar way than uh, the uh, UK, and uh, I was luckily enough to be part of the Exotic Fetal Growth Restriction Guideline. Uh, I think that's quite uh, comprehensive. The way to make the diagnosis based in Adelphi uh, criteria and uh, the follow-up of these pregnancies. Uh, we have uh, the truffle trial, that's the big guidance uh, to define the best time of delivery between 26 to 32 weeks uh, of pregnancy. But of course, uh, the uh, American guidelines that uh, you are using, uh, they are using a cutoff uh, for a fetal growth restriction uh, when estimated fetal weight below the 10th percentile. Uh, They're also identifying a high-risk population. Uh, it's difficult to know uh, what's the best one. Uh, the best one will be the best one and, uh, that's identifying uh, uh, the, the outcomes. Uh, but I'm sure that the discussion will be very rich. Gabrielle? Yeah? Gabri if you'd asked Fabrizio that question last year, he would have said it would have been the Brazilian approach. And this year, he would say it's not the one coast <laughs> approach. <laughs> yeah. Fabrizio just moved from Brazil to Australia, so uh, <laughs> he's a doctor. <laughs> I'm, I'm back, back in Australia. I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, up from Brazil, uh, that I did my training in Brazil and part of my training in Australia. I lived in Australia for 10 years and back in Brazil for two and a half years. That was a very interesting and different time last year with the COVID pandemic because uh, Brazil was really uh, rich by the, the pandemic and uh, maternal mortality. That's another topic that you're going to... Uh, to have uh, in our conference, uh, maternal mortality related with COVID. Uh, there is an up, up and coming uh, Mexican uh, researcher, that's uh, Reagan, is going to present his experience in Mexico uh, with the uh, social uh, uh, factors associated with maternal mortality. And you have the closing uh, plenary session with uh, leader, uh, leader researchers that they put some registries uh, uh, putting all global data about COVID. Certainly, uh, uh, COVID will be one of uh, the main topics that I'm very keen to watch. Yeah, and Gabriel, to, to, to Fab's point as well, the, the closing plenary, as he's touched on, <clears throat> will be focusing specifically on uh, the impact of COVID and not just where we are and, and, and how it's affected us, but moving forward, how we can learn to live with the virus. And there's different luminaries from, from different parts of the world, from UK, Europe, Asia, North America, South America. So we will get to see a very different perspective. And you're even seeing now that different parts of the world's currently here in Sydney. I think within Australia, I think around about 12 million Australians are in a, a full lockdown. And that's something that the UK has been free of for the last probable, well, since Freedom Day. And the numbers seem to be, you know, it seem to be falling. So, you know, we're in a very different state where we've got only around about 20% of our population fully vaccinated. So Australia's got a long way to go before we learn to live with the virus. So I think the closing plenary is going to, I think, really bring together some wonderful experts to talk about uh, the implications of COVID uh, on, on, on health and, and, how, and how we function as a society. Yeah, I think that's going to be really good. And I, I heard you guys speak about it going to be a new perspective as well, where it's not just going to be covering sort of similar things that like clinical management, but really like the lessons learned and what you can do going forward. And um, you've both mentioned, you know, a lot of the, you know, the our viewers, the community's most popular speakers. Um, I, you know, we've got we, Chris of Lees, Rabbi Chawi, Alfred Abahamid, um, Antonia Tester, Lil Valentine. We've got 200, uh, nearly 200 faculty. Um, so I can't name them all, but we've, you know, you can, they're, they're going to be, you know, announced soon. Um, uh, but actually, I want to sort of maybe touch on maybe the less familiar names. Is there anyone you think actually they're coming up um, or they're less familiar with um, to our audience? Um, but actually, we should be really paying attention to because it's going to give some very exciting talk. So maybe Fabrizio, do you want to start? If there's anyone you want to know? Yes, one of these, uh, the uh, sessions that uh, I really like uh, from our Congress is the top abstracts, because a big opportunity to, uh, to see uh, uh, brand new research. And this year, uh, particularly, 
uh, we have uh, up and coming uh, young researchers and that they are not very familiar to ESOG. And the uh, regional presence is quite interesting. One uh, is from uh, Australia and Spain, from Mexico that I, I, I just man uh, mentioned, that's uh, Reagan Porti uh, Martinez Portilla. Uh, the other one that's going to present about international uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, to improve the diagnosis of heart malformations is uh, uh, Feng Fei Su from China, a completely different region of the world. And the third one is uh, Rasmus Christensen from uh, Denmark, also uh, from the young generation that's going to, uh, to present about uh, increased nuchal translucency and uh, mortality associated with heart defects. Uh, you can see that uh, these uh, new names, they are coming from different parts of the world and with very high level uh, research. Oh, that's excellent. It really is like an international program. There's quite a lot. And, and how about you, George? Is there any names that you want to highlight that we don't normally hear? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that ISWOG has, I think, embraced really well over the last three to four years is the, the next generation. And so within the next generation group of, of young investigators and those that are now, uh, I suppose, casting their own shallow shadow, developing their own unit, developing their own reputation. So you've got surgeon Sasso, who's based in the UK, who's a gynae oncologist, and um, he's doing work um, in the field of uh, looking at uh, uterine transplants. So he's a very exciting speaker and very young and dynamic. Matthew Leonardi, who worked with me in Australia for two and a half years, is now back in Hamilton in, in Canada, and he'll be talking about um, a new ultrasound technique called sonopedography to, to visualize superficial endometriosis, which could be a, a real game changer in the, in the, in the diagnosis of uh, endometriosis with the most common form being superficial endometriosis. Um, and also Chris Kiriakou, who works with Tom Bourne. So he's gone to the next level with work that uh, Shavs Budwala did in relation to uh, mathematical modeling to predict the outcome of PULs. And they've really worked quite closely and uh, performing large multi-center studies, looking at the ability of modeling to, to um, uh, reduce uh, follow-up of these women without compromising safety. So I think the contribution of the next generation is really uh, a, a big part of the success of the upcoming program as it was last year when we had our first virtual meeting. Yeah, and obviously we know that they go, um, they, you know, become the leaders of the future because George, they obviously they'll be like you, hopefully not presenting to only four people. They'll probably, <laughs> we've got thousands of people coming to the Congress. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> they will, they are the scientific chairs of the future as, as we have evidence on this call today. Um, I wanted to sort of bring actually also something about patients. I know that we don't have much time left, but Fritzio, do you want to talk a bit more about the sort of the patient um, perspective that we're that's quite new this year? Yeah, I think that we uh, we uh, started uh, to have a, a patient participation last year for, uh, for the first time, but certainly we are working more this year, and we have some uh, uh, exciting sessions. Uh, with uh, patients that they had experience with preeclampsia, fetal loss. Uh, we have a sick mother, uh, uh, and she's from the uh, European uh, Preeclampsia uh, Association. Jill Robinson uh, uh, from the uh, US, that she has a very rich uh, experience, and she's uh, uh, an amazing speaker. Mark Green, uh, Mark is from the uh, uh, UK Preeclampsia Association. And they are bringing this patient perspective and uh, the way that we, we can understand our patients better. And, and of course, with, with the uh, our work, uh, how can you improve their, uh, not just their outcomes, but also uh, their uh, experience as well. Uh, and also, can I say, Gabrielle, I think that that aspect of, of such a meeting where you've got a, a huge international platform to, to, to invite and to embrace the patient experience is a really important aspect, not just for, 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 for those who are listening, but it's a great opportunity for us to learn, to have an understanding of the patient's journey. And um, particularly in early pregnancy loss, with the work that we know in relation to the rates of, of anxiety and PTSD, um, the patient experience as, a, as an individual, as a couple, 
uh, when it comes to pregnancy loss at all gestations is, is something that is uh, incredibly moving and something that we can all learn from. So that part of the program, I think, is a, is, is, is a, demonstrates, a, a, I think, a great humanity of the society as well. Yeah, and I know from the scientific committee meetings that we've had that this is really close to everyone's heart and it's really, really important. And it's so great that, you know, you're passionate about including more the patient's perspective. And that's definitely something that we're increasing every year. So um, I would encourage everyone to go to the hub. There's a hub on it and there's also a plenary or a special lecture. So do attend. We are running out of time, so I, I think all I've got to say is a, a huge thank you uh, to George and Fabrizio for joining me. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thanks, Fab. Look thank forward you. to seeing you um, virtually in October and then hopefully face to face next year. Yeah, exactly. And um, just remember that it's the 16th of August. Monday, the 16th of August is our early bird deadline um, and you know, the prices do change. So it is um, very valuable to book before then. Um, our scientific program is uh, created by two, or as part of two of the gentlemen with me today um, and the whole team, uh, scientific committee team. Um, it's all now on our website. So do go on there, search for your favourite topic and you'll see. There oh, and. And Gabrielle, before we go, we must also, Fab, we must thank Gabrielle, who, after five years of working tirelessly for ISWOG and um, bringing out the best in all of us at very unusual times of the day, um, she's moving on to, to another role. So we've got to oh, send out a huge big thank you to Gabrielle on the work she's done over five years, and she'll be greatly missed by the ISWOG office, the ISWOG team, and, and all of us and the like. So congratulations on the work oh. you've done, Gabrielle, over the last five years, and we wish, we wish you all the best. That's wonderful. Uh, thank I you very am, much, George. <laughs> thank, and thank and you so can't much, get out of that uh, because it's a live link. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Fabrizio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'll leave you on that and everyone have a very, very good day. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.